eagerly waiting for uh, uh, what's going to be there in this. So in this talk, let's focus mainly on these aspects. Uh, just few slides on what exactly in my data structures, because it may give you a recap of uh, the, the concepts of data structures, which will be explained in my own way. And uh, the applications I have just divided into these uh, major data structures, which is part of your curriculum as well. Uh, but it's not going to be like the routine kind of thing. It's going to be very interesting by bringing in the concepts uh, in one slide, plus many applications which will be, uh, it, 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 will, it will be like a, an industry kind of orientation or a social related kind of application or otherwise. So all kinds of applications where these data structures could be used and uh, uh, some of the topics or some of the slides you would see that you can take up these things as projects also when you come to seventh semester and that also I will highlight which are those topics uh, for you. So arrays, stack, queue, linked list, tree, and graph. These are the basic data structures which, uh, which we normally teach in the data structure subject. But unfortunately, the curriculum normally has a lot of theory background, algorithms, programming, etc maybe less application side. For example, in the day-to-day -day life or in the, in the industry point of view, where these data structures will be more applicable, more used. And uh, finally, we will end the session with your questions and uh, from my end, whatever the best I can answer as well. Well, so what is a data structure? Data structure is nothing but the way in which you can store your data in the memory of the computer and uh, how efficiently you can access it. So there are various, you know, data structures as I've already mentioned in the previous slide. Stack is one such data structure and uh, it gives us a facility or way by which we can access. For example, last in, first out, as you already studied. Similarly, it may be a queue. So we will, uh, you know, try to understand uh, this with just one uh, slide and then concentrate more on the application side. And uh, these data structures mainly specify what? It's the way in which it's organized. Uh, because you know that in memory, the data is going to be stored, stored uh, you know, in, in respective addresses, but the way in which we are going to talk, the you know, somebody, increase the volume yes sir it's me only sir since recording is going on i message you sir J little bit little bit you can increase sir or i can just use my headphone yes sir yes sir sure sir okay give me a second i'll just use my headphone probably Right, so the, the way in which it is organized, that is also part of, you know, a particular data structure. So that we will see in the next few slides. Okay, so unless the data structures being selected for any particular application uh, is proper, uh, it's not going to give you the way in which it is going to be accessed and it might give you some problems. So in order to make sure that your application is designed in a proper way, the selection of appropriate data structure is mandatory. So in essence, we can say that data structure is nothing but a combination of data types and its operations. So there are a set of, you know, the types which will be specified and also a set of operations which we can mention for the particular data structure. But together, 
we get the data structure well how do we classify the data structures so this is a small uh, you know diagram which specifies uh, the the fundamental uh, classification as primitive and non primitive so we have under uh, primitive data structures you know integer float cat as it's the common data structures which are built in kind of thing and non primitive data structures maybe in the latest languages you may have this also as available being under under the declaration but uh, otherwise these are called as the non primitive data structures under which we have arrays lists and files so under list we have again linear and non linear under linear stack and queue and under non linear graph and tree so these are you know the stack queue graph tree array now these are the five uh, fundamental data structures of course list so six totally which we will consider for application purpose so i'll be talking about what are the various applications which we can get out of these arrays as data structure or list let is link list or it could be stack or it could be queue etc so how do we represent the data structures so we have two ways one is called a sequential another one is linked representation so the sequential representation is more like contiguously allocated in memory because the address calculation is very very easy by using a simple formula which takes lesser time and we can assume that our data is stored on a contiguous basis but however there are some issues like you know insertion and deletion operations these are some of the disadvantages on the other hand linked representation you have the advantage of insertion and deletion which is more easier and not time consuming however there are other problems because you have to maintain the links between these what we call as nodes you know they are all connected using some kind of links but logically the data is available to us for the application to process but there are issues like if you lose the link the entire you know the data is lost so that may be a disadvantage but the way in which we represent the data structure because i can realize or i can implement my stack data structure using sequential or linked representation similarly for queue etc similarly you know any data structure you take now you can either use sequential representation or linked representation so this is just the glimpse of the uh, you know the fundamentals of the data structure now onwards i will just take you through the applications of various data structures to so start with uh, we have the arrays right so the arrays again we have one dimensional two dimensional you know multi dimensional arrays also but uh, when we try to represent the data or when we try to store the data in arrays as a data structure that gives us lot of you know of course advantages as well as disadvantages but where these kinds of arrays could act or could be used in order to uh, make sure that this will be useful for specific applications okay for instance let's assume that we want to store the image data it could be a color image like we have rgb red green and blue so each pixel may require say 24 bits so this could be stored in the form of a two dimensional array that is what we call it as the resolution for instance this is my picture probably taken using my mobile phone same thing is true for others as well and you can see the, if you go to the properties in your mobile phone or in your desktop or laptop you will see that what is the dimension that is 400 and, sorry 4608 by 3456 and uh, what is the total number of pixels in terms of width height etc so each pixel requires 24 bits you can see that bit depth because it is rgb it's a color image 
Now, on the other hand, if it is a grayscale, we need just eight bits. But imagine that in order to store each pixel, you know, uh, along with its information as a three-dimensional information that is RGB, assuming that it's a grayscale, I need to store only one byte that is eight bit. So I can store it in terms of rows and columns, which means that it could be a two-dimensional array. So that is what we call it as image pixels. So this is one place because a lot of applications are uh, going to be there for image processing, you know, image processing, which is uh, very, very, very uh, advanced fields. And I have done my research on that. So uh, the images need not be just like this, the real world images, it could be medical images and other things. So what kind of uh, image manipulations we can do? We can control the brightness, increase or decrease, contrast, enhance the color. You can convert a gray, sorry, color image into grayscale, invert, resize, rotating. I think you can do a lot of uh, operations on this. Find foreground image segmentation. Uh, I will talk about this maybe when we go to graph, uh, you know, how to get this foreground uh, image and uh, what kind of technology we can use for this. For instance, uh, if you look at any language, maybe Python or Java or C Sharp, any, any language, you will get MATLAB, you know, you will get what is known as image toolbox. OpenCV is one tool which you can integrate with C and other languages, uh, including Python, and you can, you know, use these uh, manipulation statements or what you call the APIs in order to do these kind of man. For example, color filtering you can get RGB straight away. You can get gamma filter where it actually increases the brightness too much, you know, almost double. It's called gamma filter and uh, enhance the brightness. Brightness is different from gamma and contrast you can increase. You can have grayscale, convert this color to grayscale image because it's 24 bits for each pixel. This is eight bits for each pixel. You can also invert, you know, the uh, image, color image. So all these manipulations and other manipulations, uh, you know, as I've already mentioned in the previous slide can be done. Apart from this, it also is useful for various other applications. Coming to, again, arrays, multidimensional or one-dimensional, whatever it is, in general, arrays could be used in, you know, text processing like in MS Word or PowerPoint, Excel, etc. For instance, you can insert, delete, you can search and replace a lot of applications, what we call it as the string processing applications for which, of course, we can also use uh, these things in what is known as NLP because I store my, uh, what do you call the string in an array, right? Because every language provides this option for us to store the strings in the form of an array. And I assume that I store my data, string data in an array, which could be useful for natural language processing, maybe in search engines like Google or Bing, etc. It can be used in text mining because after all, this is a text which I'm talking about. I'm storing this maybe in a file or maybe ultimately in the data structure as arrays. And there are a lot of algorithms which are also useful in this, like, you know, brute force, horse pool, Boyer-Moore, tri data structure, Huffman tree for text compression. So these are some of the string manipulation or string search algorithms, you know, basically it's for searching. So you can use brute force method. That means take a query string, and then compare character by character until you get all the characters of the query string being matched with the text string. But the efficiency of brute force is normally, you know, bad. So a lot of other efficient algorithms have been developed like Hospital algorithm, Boyer, Moore, et cetera. And for text, uh, you know, searching or um, uh, the searching uh, search engine process itself people use a lot of tree based uh, you know data structures like try the word try comes from retrieval 
and uh, compressed way of storing the information can be done by using or constructing what is known as an Huffman tree. So these are, uh, uh, you know, some of the string uh, processing or word processing or text processing applications and the corresponding algor algorithms. Now coming to this uh, NLP, natural language processing, uh, which is uh, a very, very interesting kind of topic, which you can also try as projects later on. Uh, for instance, if you Google it, you know, go to the Google search engine and you start typing some characters like this, you know, it automatically recognizes and tries to complete it and gives you the options for selecting it. That means you don't need to completely enter your keyword in the Google search engine. So this is called as search autocorrect and autocomplete. This is basically by using the NLP. Similarly, we have what is known as a language translator. So the language translator, as we know that Google, again, gives a way by which we can, you know, translate from one language to the other. I've just given an example here. You can see that I write in English. Now that is converted into Canada because I just Googled it. So it gives you this and you can see here, it says, I love orange. Suppose if my uh, text is this, it says, Nano kitle bannavannu prithistene. Actually, there is some problem in this. It's not, uh, maybe I, 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 I meant I love orange fruit, but the uh, translator actually understood that it is something to do with banna, that means color, that means orange color. Because uh, whenever this kind of ambiguity exists, see, even the machine cannot translate it properly. So what I did, I just made it like, you know, I love orange fruit. Now you can see nana kitle hannanu pritistene. So now it's able to understand. So this is the problem or the gap between man and machine. See what you think uh, may not be the same like the machine things. So the translation process has to be a bit uh, more intelligent. And at the same, same time, we should also help the translator to provide you the correct translation. Otherwise, probably you will have these kind of gaps. In fact, I have used this kind of, uh, you know, translators when I went to Thailand for my conference. Uh, so, as you know that, you know, uh, when you travel there, not everybody speaks English. So, I have to speak in Thai because I don't know Thai. So, I need to just uh, speak in English. So, what do you do? So, I have, I had my translator and uh, I just type in English. Now, it's going to show and also it will, uh, you know, uh, give a voice kind of information to the other person who knows only Thai and not English. So obviously it becomes easier for us to converse or talk to the people who do not have the knowledge of English. The same thing true even in France. So when I went to Paris, the same thing happened because not many people talk there. In fact, 90% of the people talk only French. There are a lot of other NLP applications as well. For instance, in social media monitoring, observe carefully here. Companies can use this to analyze social media posts, you know. So what people actually post it uh, about the company itself, uh, like the, what the customers think about it, uh, it is something like opinion mining. We, we call this as opinion mining. So this is one of the applications where in order to make sure that uh, we get uh, or analyze the post being uh, given away by the customers and it can be processed by using the NLP techniques because these are text-based ones, ultimately strings and then stored in array. So I'm just connecting all this array, string, then it can make some sense or meaning uh, to us, but automatically we should be able to process it by using some natural language processing methodologies. And uh, companies can actually understand what's going on and try to, that's why we have ratings, you know, the 
uh, star, you know, five star out of which how, how much. See, now it has become a very, very common kind of thing that whether the customer feels happy or not, etc. All these things can be analyzed by using the social media posting or even their own company sites. Not only companies, even government, you know, uses this concept of uh, NLP in order to understand some of the uh, threats which they may receive, you know, for the security purpose. So we have a methodology wherein these kinds of texts could be processed and try to gather some information using this NLP. Another very interesting application is chatbot, which you would have seen in many uh, sites, websites, uh, like, you know, it's a, it's a virtual agent, you know, it's a virtual support agent. So many people, again, this is uh, a project which many people have done and they're trying to improvise. I have also worked on some of these uh, chatbots, but unfortunately what happens, these are not designed very efficiently. Uh, whatever the question we give, ultimately it is going to provide similar kind of answers for all kinds of queries. That means understanding power of this chatbot is not all that good. So companies, many companies actually use this for what purpose? It is to interact with the customer and what are the advantages? Uh, customers need not get frustrated because they may call and the person may not be available in this COVID situations, number of persons working in an office also is less, all these things. To avoid all this, probably we can go for this kind of a virtual support. And additionally, it can reduce the cost of hiring the call representatives. That means that we don't require uh, too many people, physical presence of these people in order to interact because that also creates a lot of uh, unhappiness or you know bitterness between the customer and the representative so in order to avoid all this we just put a, a robo kind of you know a chatbot so that people can interact another interesting application is the survey analysis because survey again involves with a lot of uh, text and the text may can be in any form it's more unstructured uh, some people write in their own language. So the natural language processing application should understand all this and then try to give a report, you know, a final report out of this survey. So they conduct, you know, companies do conduct with the customer's feedback. This is what I said, you know, opinion mining. A lot of research is going on, a lot of projects people are taking up. Uh, for example, it could be about movies, it could be about products of some companies, or it could be even the colleges, you know, the student feedback is very important. Okay, now this can be useful in understanding the flaws in companies or colleges and improvise. It's not just to criticize any, any, any company or organization, but in order to improve. See, I should know the drawbacks of my company uh, 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 whether my service is good, whether my products are good, etc. And uh, supposing if you get a lot of, uh, you know, survey results, I mean, survey uh, uh, inputs, the input data coming from different customers, it is so huge, it comes under big data category, and it's not so easy to analyze all of them. So NLP helps to analyze all this. Another application of NLP again is targeted advertising. That means that you would have seen that uh, whenever you browse through the net, after some time, or even Amazon or Flipkart, after some time you get on the right hand side, you know, whatever the products you have advertised, I'm sorry, uh, browsed, those things will appear and you will be able to uh, get some information. So they just uh, understand your need right it's not simply showing everything there but it is more targeted based upon what you have already searched that means the earlier searching so targeted advertisement is uh, important based upon the keywords which you have already searched in the google and it's going to use those things in order to show your flash that these are the things which you may be interested in 
and they may just prompt you to purchase. Another uh, application is for uh, hiring and recruitment process because as you know that many companies receive CVs from people, you know, the uh, applicants, there are a lot of applicants who apply and sometimes some of the big companies, you, know, you may get one lakh, two lakh applications every day. This was told by one of the HR manager actually. And, uh, uh, how, how, how do we go through all these things manually? See, we cannot force uh, manual processing here because we have to actually get the right applicant or the right application which is suitable for my work or my project. How do we select? So we can do all of them by using this NLP. So it may take hours or even days to filter. And uh, sometimes the companies, in fact, uh, one of my old students who is part of the HR actually with the recruitment process, he said that they will not have even one day time, 24 hours time to actually shortlist. They may need 10 people or 15 people immediately, the right candidates. So this can be automated by using again NLP. Not only the text-based one in terms of real text, but it could be voice. So voice converted into text, etc. So for which again, we have voice assistants, Alexa, I think you'd have seen in advertisements, Siri, you know, all of them like Apple, Siri, Amazon, Alexa, etc. So these are nowadays, even it is available in TVs, Google, uh, high, uh, high Google kind of, you know, uh, thing. So everything is done uh, not through typing the text, which is stored in the array and then process, etc., but through voice. So voice converted into text, store it in the array and then process it. So NLP will be able to do that. So voice assistant uh, will be able to recognize this speech and then apply these algorithms and data structure algorithms or store it in the proper data structure like arrays and then process it and then provide appropriate service. Another interesting application is called as grammar checks, check, checking kind of, uh, you know, software called as Grammarly. Uh, so this is again to make sure that your sentences are in compliance with the regular English grammar. So even if you do not know proper English, it assists you to write in a better way. So it may be a beautiful literature. Uh, give me a second. Okay, so Grammarly is a make to make sure that you know this text what you type should be uh, should carry good English, etc., which can be done automatically. Uh, so this is another interesting application used uh, in many places. Right, this uh, email filtering again. So there are a lot of applications. I'm trying to just. Uh, uh, reduced uh, versions only I'm showing here. So it's called email filtering, which again you would have seen in Gmail, where incoming email can be categorized into primary or social or promotion or forum. So this is another application, which many people have done project, they are also doing project, you know, all that. So it, it is uh, for segregated, not only that, even spam, I think uh, that will be automatically filtered. So uh, you can see here that it's filtered out automatically and uh, 
spam filters uh, are uh, we'll we'll see that later you know how to classify a particular e how to classify a particular email as one of these categories primary yeah i i hope that i'm audible i just got some noise hello yeah am i am i audible now hello okay thank you thank you thank you right so this is called as email filtering right so we will now move on to another very interesting data structure called as uh, yeah there is one more message okay same thing right so this is called as uh, dictionary which is uh, uh, data structure which is used in big data again i'll come to that but uh, meanwhile what exactly we mean by dictionary say so i i in order to understand uh, a very very advanced kind of a data structure and an application called as bloom's filter you know the data structure called bloom's filter uh, this is uh, sometimes called as uh, uh, probabilistic data structure which you not have heard of uh, normal data structures it's okay but probabilistic data structure is something very interesting i'll come to that in order to understand that we need the knowledge of dictionary so what is a dictionary it is basically key value pair you know key value pair so what does it mean it means that supposing assume that i try to you know declare a dictionary where i have a key like panda and what is the value so whenever i search for a key given key i'll get this value for instance dictionary of kona you can see here this is my key so i'll get la so it could be used to like you know a name maybe a key and telephone number may be the value so key value pairs are quite common in our day to day life or in the real world applications so we store this in a data structure called as a dictionary which is called as map or association list as well in fact people who have studied c++ uh you can you can implement this by overloading the operator called a square bracket it's a very interesting application in fact i have mentioned this in my book uh, c++ book where is it useful key value pair is useful in what is known as hadoop map reduce framework what is this this is nothing but the uh framework which is used uh, in big data analytics that means when we have the data size which is huge like google or facebook twitter whatsapp so many things you know all this data is so huge in order to process this store this uh, etc uh, you know people use what is known as hadoop framework in which map reduce is an algorithm which is used in order to quickly find these things now to give you an example assume that we have a set of documents okay let's assume that we have a set of documents uh let's say you know five documents you have five uh, books let's take now you have to count how often each word occurs in all these five documents we can do it parallelly instead of doing it sequentially that's what your hadoop framework is all about so because sequentially if you do it it will take time and when i go for parallel kind of uh, thing you know execution i'll get uh, things processed very fast so in which we use actually a key value pair where it is nothing but uh, the line number documented line number with the text and then the output will be like word and number of occurs this is another key value pair so each word how many times it occurs in all the documents of course so it will be done parallelly uh so that is uh, maybe when you go to seventh semester you will study these things or eighth semester i think uh your big data analytics 
So Hadoop architecture uses this MapReduce with respect to your map or the uh, dictionary data structure. Another concept which we require here is called as hashing. So hash uh, or hashing technique is normally used in order to reduce the searching time as of the order of one. That means given a key, you'll be able to immediately retrieve. You'll be able to retrieve it very fast. So like in a linear search, you may require of the order of n, worst case, and in a binary search, maybe log n, etc. But in any case, in hashing, you can get it very fast. So that's a data structure which is used in order to store our keys by first hashing it. How do we do that? Using a hash function. I'll show you that in the next slide. So the hash table is the main, you know, data structure for implementing these dictionaries. So it can be used in symbol table, in compilers or assemblers, where the user defined symbols, etc., can be stored in a symbol table along with other details. So how does this hashing technique work? It's very simple. Assume that this is my simplest hashing function where I just take a key and then hash it. That means get the reminder because it is a mod function and uh, based upon the size of the hash table. Let's assume that 10 locations I allocate for my hash table. So 0 to 9, that is my hash table size. And whenever I get a key, I just hash it. That means get the remainder. For example, 23 is my key divide, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, mod 10, I'll get three as my reminder, you can see here. Then, so when I get this three is the index in my array where I could store this 23. You can see here 23 is stored here. And next 56, the reminder is six and uh, store that in index six and so on. So the data is stored. Supposing if I want to search for nine, again hash it, you know, I get the address as nine or the index as nine, I simply go there and pick my, so it is one small function execution called hashing function. I'll be able to store and retrieve of the order of one. That's it. One uh, unit of time is enough to retrieve or search. But there are some issues, of course, there may be a collision. For example, if I want to store, uh, uh, say 43, which would hash it, I mean, the hash address will be again three, but 23 is already there. So we call this as collision. So we have a lot of collision resolution techniques, algorithms are there. Let's not go into that. But what is our main goal here is to talk about Bloom filters. So what is a Bloom filter? It is a data structure designed to tell you rapidly and memory efficiently whether an element is present in a set or not. It was uh, conceived in 1970 by Bloom. Okay, what are the applications of Bloom filters? We'll come to that. First, let us understand what is Bloom filter. So as I said earlier, this is a probabilistic data structure. There are a bit of uh, uh, you know, issues in this as well. But 99%, uh, you know, uh, we get the advantage because we need an efficient, faster way of getting it. So how, how, how does it work? Basically, an empty Bloom filter is a bit array. You know, this is an application for arrays again with M bits initially all set to zero. Actually, it is a Boolean filter. I mean, Boolean array. It can have either zero or one. So there must also be k different hash function. It's not one hash function. Let us assume k hash functions. So whenever you, okay, now which maps or hashes some set of elements, etc. I think I'll, I'll show you an example. It's very easy to understand. Okay, this is the example. Now let us assume that we have three keys, x, y, z, which need to be stored in the Bloom filter array. So X is to be sent to the hashing functions. Let us assume K equal to three. That means there are three hash functions, right? So we have first it is hashed. 
using a first hash function x is hashed using a first hash function get the address and store it so this is my hashing address it is stored send it to the second hashing function and store it again so blue color assume that this okay this one is my second hashing function address the third one is this where i get my third address for the same key so x is sent to three hashing functions and each hashing function gives an address or the index in the array bloom's filter array and from zero default value it is made as one we don't store the key remember we don't store the key that's why the memory requirement for this array again is just one bit okay so now we have simply converted or modified the existing value of 0 to 1 that's it take the next key y and then do the same thing three hashing functions red one you can see made into one z again same purple you can see that all are converted from 0 to 1 now after completing this okay this is the process so to add an element feed it to each of the k functions and then convert them into one and to query, now coming to query. Supposing assume that I want to query, okay, W. W is my query key, which I want to check whether it's there in the set or not. So what do I do? Again, I send it to the three hash functions and see whether all these three are ones. If all the three were ones, query for an element and hash functions, if any of the bits is zero, okay, we'll come to the successful case later. It is a not found case. So if any of this is zero, for example, W, assume that the first hash function is correct, one. Second, it's correct, one. But the third one, assume that it is giving zero. So if any of the hash functions gives a zero, which means that this is not, there, it's not hashed properly. That means the key is not present here, okay? Because it was not set. If it has already been there, probably we would have set it to one. So that's the idea. So if all are one, so that would happen for X, that would happen for Y, if those are the keys to be searched. Because if all are one, definitely it is there, okay? Definitely. So that is the, uh, advantage of bloom filter memory efficient and faster you you don't need, require a lookup table you don't require uh, a, a, a time consuming uh, searching you know all that is not required but where do we use this bloom filter we can use this bloom filter in what is known as approximate membership queries okay and uh, a very very uh, straightforward uh, understandable application is this. Not only one, many. For example, Akamai Technologies, which is a very popular IT company, they use this Bloom filter for their uh, content delivery provider. That is one hit wonders. So that's the, because they are, they are uh, uh, using this in disk uh, caches, you know, files being stored. Another uh, company called uh, Google, uh, which comes from Big Table and uh, Apache, HB, these are all in Big Data Analytics, Apache Cassandra, PostgreSQL, these are all, uh, you know, database related one. These uh, things use Bloom filters to reduce the disk lookups. Because remember in database, what happens, we have, we, our data is stored in the disk. So we have to fetch this data from the disk back to your memory. So we can quickly get this using Bloom filters. Next, we have uh, uh, Google uh, Chrome browsers. They use this for malicious, uh, to identify malicious URLs. Uh, as you know that HTTPS, uh, you know, yes means the secure one, but others, sometimes you get the error message also saying that it is malicious or back to safety all. So in order to design one such thing, they use this Bloom filters. Then we have uh, Microsoft Bing. 
which uses this for uh, hierarchical bloom filters okay the variation of that in uh, search indexing category and a uh, lot of other applications as well in bitcoin you can also many students do projects when they come to seventh semester about this blockchain a bitcoin bit world blockchain is very popular okay and uh, is another interesting application is in short url you would have seen that uh, bitly you know uh, there are a lot of uh, online uh, sites like b bit.ly bitly uh, which uh, you can send a long url and you will get a short url back okay that you can use it so in order to search for that uh, generate and search quickly this uh, you know short url we can use bloom filters so that's a real life application mobi likes a very lengthy kind of urls okay so these are the applications which you have seen uh, about your arrays now we will move on to the stack stack queue list in the same order i'll just uh, take up few applications right so we have uh, uh, i don't go into details of stack everybody knows that it is last in first out and uh, applications also you do study like uh, infix to postfix conversion postfix evaluation etc parenthesis matching in compilers etc now these are standard applications which the teachers teach uh, like but uh, here we have let's assume that a company is facing recession like in covid situation and trying to implement layoffs and what is the policy being uh, done for layoff it is that who have joined uh, uh, you know recently most recently uh, most junior most people you can see most recent people who have joined uh, will be knocked off that means they may be uh, sent back that means lay off, laid off something like that so last in will go first so we can implement this uh, policy using stack then we have what is known as undo operation uh, which you would have seen in many like uh, editors microsoft or any other editors control z so this kind of uh, undo operation that means back the most recent one last inserted one the the action can In order to implement this undo then similarly the uh, browsers you know they have the back button which is uh, takes you to the previous uh, you know url or the page web page so which will be stored in the stack that means uh, top of the stack then uh, function calls in compilers this also they would have already taught you that is the most easiest application which we can think of that means a function calling another function that function in turn calling another nested function kind of thing and how does it come back to the most recently called function so all these return addresses are stored in the stack and uh, mathematical expressions i think i already told you parsing and uh, java virtual machine this jvm uses uh, threads i think when you study java you'll come to know that uh, these things the threads state they will i mean the the stack frames they call it actually so that will be stored in the stack and uh, backtracking algorithms maze problem i think uh, again stack is uh, used as part of your curriculum as well and uh, depth first search algorithm that we will be studying later uh, but that is also an application of stack uh, similarly we have breadth first search where queue data structure will be used and the browsing history i think that i have already told you because history is stored in the reverse chronological order that means a stack lost in first out now coming to the applications of queues you can uh, see uh, what is known as a music player like uh, youtube music you know youtube you know youtube music also is there most of you must be aware where you can see here add to queue you know 
so q data structure is used in these kinds of players as well and uh, adding into this playlist that's a list so that we can take it actually for the linked list kind of application but here uh, you know the q the first in first out is the operation which we require so keep adding into your queue so whatever you have uh, you know added first will be played and uh, other songs will be waiting in the queue uh, a very standard application which many people talk about is the print queue because assume that there is only one printer and which is connected to many systems and uh, if all people give this print command it cannot go and print everything together you know all files so it has to be put in what is known as a print queue or that uh, the, the the queue is maintained automatically such that uh, the print jobs can be taken up one by one then we have scheduling and uh, how the jobs are being processed which are there in the queue in the, the the ready queue we can call it which is which is in the database applications or operating system application or wherever we require this single server multiple jobs to be processed you know it can be put in a queue telephone calls as you know that again uh, you would have you would have heard the voice that you are in a queue uh, it, it, it tells you even the numbers you are the fourth person so all people so any any incoming call will be added into the queue and you 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 know that your uh, turn i mean you have to wait until your turn comes ticket booking systems youtube music, music player concurrent fifo queues there is another uh, very interesting uh, variation in the normal queue is called concurrent fifo queue and uh, traffic systems as you know that queue vehicles come and uh, you know get added uh, in a queue fashion uh, but traffic system actually goes on a circular basis so we can implement uh, a traffic system using a circular queue because uh, let's assume that is a four uh, directions and uh, in in each lane you have your vehicles coming and standing that's a normal queue but it will get cleared on a circular basis when we talk about double ended queue there are very interesting applications for instance the browsing history so we need recently visited uh, sites are added at one end you know what is double ended queue because items can be added and deleted from either end you know elements can be added deleted on either end so that means you have to implement front insertion front deletion rear insertion and rear deletion all four functions so here the recently visited sites are added at one end say let's say rear and we want to let's say have a limit on the number of sites which are stored in our history double ended queue that means we have to delete also See, otherwise we can't add so probably you can delete from the front see that's what shown here front deletion is required sometimes we may want to remove the newly visited sites also from the rear so all these four may be useful in order to maintain your browsing history okay now let's move on to the linked list linked list as we know that it's a set of nodes connected through links and singly linked list we can just tra traverse from the first node maybe a header node to the last node where the next field of the last node is normally marked as null indicating that no more next nodes are there so where this could be useful i mean this data structure could be useful it may be used in implementing stack and queue on a list based that means instead of using arrays where it is fixed number we can just go for list where it can be you know indefinite infinite number of elements which could be added and deleted 
in the stack as well as queue. We can also use this in what is known as adjacency list, which is part of our graph, you know, representing a graph. And uh, supposing assume that you have a very long integer, which need to be, you know, evaluated like addition or multiplication, whatever it is, we can store these integers in a linked list form. Sparse matrices, which have more zeros and less actual values, called as sparse matrices, which are uh, very common in electrical engineering and other, you know, uh, civil engineering, etc. And uh, this can be represented using what is known as multi-link structures. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, image viewers. A uh, lot of uh, apps are there actually. Even you get that in your gallery kind of app in the mobile phones. Uh, similarly, in Windows, you know, you get. So we can just uh, uh, use this linked list. Maybe a doubly linked list. Maybe you can go from one end to the other, or on either end, in order to look into the next image or the previous image. So image viewers can use this list very efficiently. And similarly, web browsers, both uh, forward and backward movement, and music players. I showed you already a YouTube music uh, player where we can just uh, list of you know songs or list of movies to be played, etc. Another uh, uh, question which comes to our mind is uh, where does the circular linked list will be useful? So it's again, you know, implementing queue style, all that it's okay. But when multiple applications are running on a PC, the OS can put the running applications on the list and then cycle through them. So that's one advantage, mainly the operating system. And uh, make sure that you know, it, it works on a round robin way. That means it works on a circular fashion. <coughs> And doubly linked, coming to doubly linked list, we can implement text editors because, uh, you know, you have uh, the cursor which can move either way, left or right. If I store all my text, particular line, for instance, uh, in the form of a doubly linked list. So I can just move both ways because as you know, the doubly linked list, I can move forward and also I can move backward. So it's very, very easy to you know, move the cursor uh, back and forth. Then we have uh, the playlist again, back and forth. And uh, undo and redo functionality in many editors and other places. Back uh, and forward in browsers. And uh, various states of a game, you know, uh, in any computer game, for instance. Uh, in deck of cards, because shuffling, uh, has to be done and the cards have to be uh, you know linked in such a way that they represent these are the cards available so i'll just show you that in the figure you'll be able to understand so it's a double linked list where this uh, next one shows what are the cards next and the previous uh, link actually shows what are the previous cards so all this entire deck of cards can be shown that it can be implemented using uh, a doubly linked uh, list. Another uh, application where this doubly linked list uh, could be useful is called as movie editors, uh, which is a very common, you know, uh, application which many people use with uh, YouTube channels and movie makers and uh, etc. Now, here I have shown a very popular uh, application called as Blender, uh, which is a free open source uh, software, which you can download, which I've already done. And I'm just showing here as a screenshot uh, where you can actually edit this on a frame by frame basis. You can have multiple movie clips. You can join them, I mean, stretch them. You can cut, you know, trim them. Um, you can add text. A lot of editing can be done for this uh, move. So you can you can move left, right, frame wise, etc. So for which doubly linked list is a very good option. 
another very uh, interesting application is called uh, netflix most of you must have seen this where it is a list of list which is a w link circular w link sorry circular w link list why because uh, people who have uh, gone through this uh, you will first see that uh, categorized i mean the movie list is categorized like this for instance critically acclaimed dark tv dramas watch it again uh, maybe language wise and uh, you know what you have already seen so each of this you know each of this is a circular w linked list you can come back you can go forward moment you reach here again it uh, you know it it keeps circulating so this is one circular w linked list now you have the second you have the third you have the fourth like that i think around 8 to 9 or 10 categories are there i don't remember exactly but uh, i am a member uh, i have subscribed for this so every time you know we keep moving here and you can come down etc so each one is a w linked list circular and they are all connected maybe with another link etc so in order to implement netflix uh, ott you can just uh, use this circular w linked list coming to uh, trees so uh, <laughs> there are a numerable number of trees actually it is a list i will concentrate uh, on very few trees like kedi tree interesting ones and uh, dacian trees i think that's enough okay so binary search trees uh, i i'm not going to the theory part of it it's to search an element it's a binary search concept and uh, heap heap sort actually sorting set of element so it's constructed is in the form of a heap and tries uh, based on some keywords it's done uh, which i already said and is used in modern routers and the b tree b plus tree etc are used in database applications and compiler syntax tree uh, database again you have uh, query tree uh, and the evaluation of expressions using an expression tree decision tree we have an application here what is known as a classification problem which is part of artificial intelligence or machine learning now assume that this is my data where i have certain parameters or features and this is my training data we call it and uh, the system can be trained or modeled and uh, how, how, what is the model being used is a decision tree so construct the decision tree using this known facts and uh, any unknown fact or any unknown uh, you know record or unknown uh, sample can be just used uh, sorry this decision tree can be used in order to find the target label so suppose assume that uh, you know i have trained my system and built my uh, uh, this one you know decision tree in order to find out whether a patient a new patient uh, is covid positive or not covid negative uh, based upon certain parameters right so i can just build this tree and then give this new sample it will be able to tell me intelligently that whether the patient is covid positive or negative similarly here the example shows that it is for this is the class label so depending upon these combinations there is a known fact so all these things are used in order to build this decision tree okay now supposing if i have a new uh, you know customer here for instance uh, having these uh, values known but this is unknown this is not known i'll just go through this for example what is the reference error if it is s yes, that means uh, it cannot be given and if it is no we need further uh, parameters to check you know like what is the marital status if it is married that means refund is no if the person is married then don't give if the refund is no person is single or divorced and the taxable income is greater than 80k then you give loan 
something like that. So any new person, we can easily, you know, go through this decision tree and take a decision whether it can be granted loan or not. So like this, there are many applications uh, which would actually be used in order to classify uh, any unknown sample based upon the known things, which we call as training data. So we train the model. The model here is nothing but the decision tree. Similarly, association rule binding. This is another area where uh, the tree called as hash trees are useful. So this is very popular in what is known as the uh, basket uh, market basket problem, where we want to know the buying pattern of a customer, you know, the customer's buying pattern. For example, the first bill or the first customer buys only bread and milk. Second customer may buy bread, diaper, beer and eggs, etc. So this, based upon this training information, we can actually create what is known as a hash tree uh, and then try to build the structure such that we can get the buying pattern. And uh, an efficient way of getting what is known as frequent patterns, because what is the need or what is the purpose of constructing this is to find out the frequent pattern. That means in order to find out that majority of customers, which are the items which they buy together, whether it is bread and milk or bread and egg, something like that. So the frequent pattern, this comes in mining, data mining, of course, but tree, a, a, a very popular tree called as frequent pattern tree is used. So using this kind of a tree, we can actually generate the frequent patterns very fast. Another uh, place where this tree is useful is called uh, the web pages, where the web page may be following a particular uh, hierarchical model uh, called as document object model and uh, which may have this HTML tags uh, uh, by following this. For example, you can see that this is the outermost one. Inside which you have a head and a body. Under this head, you can define all this. Under body, you have, again, these things, para paragraph tags, and you have uh, other tags. So all these tags come under this. So there is a particular structure, you know, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, not a full structure, but maybe a semi-structure, which at least each web page follows, and uh, which is called uh, as DOM, you know, document object model. So this follows what is known as a tree model or a tree structure called as a DOM tree. Another uh, area altogether is called as the spatial trees or the spatial data structures. So normal, from normal data structures, uh, there are a lot of applications where this uh, spatial data structures will be uh, useful. So what exactly we mean by spatial data? See, normal data being stored in regular data structures, it's fine. But here, what we call this as spatial data, it's the address, latitude, longitude. See, this gives us some kind of spatial information or the location information, like Google map, you share your location, you know, latitude, longitude, or address. So it contains both spatial and non-spatial attributes or non-spatial components. Spatial with respect to where and how. For example, it could be Google map, it could be, you know, other kind of applications which uses this spatial information. Uh, parks, the land area, uh, there's a lot of applications which actually use this uh, uh, representing or storing the spatial information in, in data structures, proper data structures. For example, if I want to store a lake, for example, Kaveri River starts at some point and ends at some other point, I want to store this in, in, in memory using some data structure. Similarly, I want to store the parks in Bangalore in my data structure, you know, all parks uh, located at different areas, different places, you know, uh, map, Google map, for instance, a lot of applications or projects are plenty in this. Uh, 
like uh, you know it can be in geology it could be ge uh, geographic information system um, example you are uh, uh, you know the air quality index aqi we call it uh, agriculture and uh, this one medical field robotics in malls you know the geographical position nowadays robots are used in order to uh, you know in order to transport items from one place to the other and then properly position it in the malls or in departmental stores big departmental stores like metro cash and carry etc manually they don't do it they use robots uh, uh, multiple robots many robots are used and they should not hit you know uh, with one another for all these things spatial data structures are very much needed okay so what is uh, uh, needed here is the spatial queries also once you store it you should be able to retrieve on a spatial basis for example you would have seen in google also uh, like in google map uh, you know uh, what is near to me maybe you you are interested in finding out uh, nearest restaurants or nearest uh, um, petrol banks etc i want to find out which is closer to me that's quite uh, of any shop for example i want to purchase certain things i want to know which is closer to me that's spatial in terms of north south etc then you may have the, the issues here is that some of the spatial things may be overlapping intersecting regions you know all that so how do we store this in, in our data structures so we can use uh, what is known as quad tree or tree kd tree so i'll just uh, uh, elaborate on this quickly uh, how these are represented first you know the spatial to these data structures in the form of trees uh, uh, for instance we use a concept called as minimum bounding rectangle what does it mean it is a, a smallest rectangle that completely contains the object like this it should be a minimum you know size with x and y1 and x2 y2 so this covers the entire area it may be an irregular shape it could be a lake or it could be uh, a park something like that so we should be able to enclose this with a minimum bounding region okay it could be further divided into this that's what google does in the map okay after that we can spatially close objects in n dimensional space okay and put it uh, in a proper tree what is that tree quad tree so this is nothing but a hierarchical decomposition of the space into quadrant four quadrant i show you that in the next slide the diagram where it is modeling my spatial information into into a tree you can see here so i have made four quadrant here northwest northeast southwest and southeast and the original root now i have four uh, branches it's a multi way tree it's not a binary tree so because i have four now this northwest okay northeast i can further divide that into four quadrant the blue line and you can see that northeast is here second one so i just take this and divide to four quadrant now that in turn again may be further divided into four quadrant so it, the tree keeps growing uh, the depth and the levels and essentially the spatial information has been transformed into quad tree and uh, our tree for instance is an approach to index the spatial data so that you can quickly get the uh, data from the root once you search through the root you can easily get it for example this is my overall spatial information a that the root it consists of two major mbrs that is minimum bounding rectangle b and c you can see here next level b in turn consists of def that's represent and so on so it becomes now a r tree where it's a recursive kind of thing where every level you get the objects which are part of that region 
like this so we can just uh, search this is this looks like a b tree or a b plus tree people who knows about it you know i can easily understand because in one node i can accommodate many keys so my region 1 region 2 region uh, there is many regions actually the major one are region 1 and 2 the thick uh, rectangle so that's what it shows further r1 has so many r2 has so many regions so we can keep on adding these into different levels and nodes so essentially i have transformed my you know spatial one to trees so kd tree is a very interesting one where we have number of dimensions so it's a multi dimensional tree called as k dimensional tree uh, and uh, how does it look like okay this is how we build it uh, formulate it so this is my x axis y axis so each uh, element consists of two uh, you know components maybe longitude latitude kind of thing so 30 and 40 how do we construct this tree so every level we keep alternating x and y so for instance 30 and 40 becomes the root next 5 and 25 5 is x so here i need to search for y so 25 something like a binary search tree so 25 is less than 40 so i take a left branch and insert here the third one is 10 12 so 10 is x so x comparison less you know 10 is less than 30 come to the left branch and uh, compare y 12 is less than 25 come here it's empty so add it so every level you keep alternating x and y uh, so it's not one element, single element kind of thing in a, unlike a binary search tree. So what happens here is that the old region of the points which are represented in a two-dimensional fashion, uh, that is K is true now, 2D, it's a 2D structure, I can represent this. But when the number of dimensions are more, then the tree becomes complicated, of course, you know, with three or four values. So how does it help? So KD tree with a three dimensional one, it's a cube, which uh, you can see visually uh, with this diagram, but how does it help? Now, many of you may not be knowing that how exactly uh, Ola and Uber or KFC, Zomato, Domino's, you know, work. See, there are a lot of outlets spread across a city, for instance, Bangalore. Now, let's take, uh, uh, the case of Ola. So you book a car or a cab from a particular place, say here. There are so many cabs, cabs which are available here. Now this information, booking information goes to the central unit of Ola center and then they try to send information to all the nearest ones geographically and then they'll be able to, you know, find, okay, this person is interested because that also is important uh, because cars may not be owned by Ola. They may be, owners may be themselves, the driver themselves may be the owners and they will try to uh, be informed that, uh, okay, this person. So if they're okay, then you will get the message saying that this person is interested and his car number, uh, his mobile number, etc., will be shared. So the nearest one is very important because he can quickly reach you. The same thing like you just uh, order in uh, Domino's or KFC and again it goes to the central system and uh, depending upon your address where you are located, the nearest KFC will be informed. So you will not get from the main which may be far away but you will get this delivered, I mean your food delivered uh, with, from the nearest KFC outlet. So that's the kind. So this useful, this can be done as a project, you know, like uh, uh, inform to the nearest police station. So I will not know which is the nearest police station. Uh, I have to Google it and uh, you know all that. That's not required because it can give you uh, immediately which is the nearest police station not to report a crime. Web crawlers again use uh, all these things uh, in order to build the web pages. Coming to graph, which is my last uh, data structure. So you have studied all this. Graph is nothing but a set of vert uh, vertices and edges. 
and you have a lot of varieties of graphs, undirected, directed, connected, disconnected, weighted, all these kinds of graphs are there and it, each one has its own applications. Um, in these areas like electrical engineering, telecom, computer networks, broadband network, mobile network, TV network, <laughs> just plenty of networks, network graph, it's the same. Roadmap, Google map, coloring the map is very interesting, uh, you know, application. finding the shortest path, which Google uses, you know, source to destination, etc. is another very um, useful example is what is known as traveling salesperson problem. This is a tour, you know, uh, where the traveling salesperson would like to, which may be the starting city and uh, uh, he has to visit all the cities and come back to the parent cities. So what is the minimal tour cost which he can be suggested with? And this is a connected, uh, undirected, weighted graph. So the cost indicates maybe the traveling cost or the distance, etc. So essentially, this is not a shortest path uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, problem, but it is shortest path is source to destination, right? It's not back to the source. Here it's not like that. If it is starting point is one, you have to come back to the starting point. So short, shortest path, uh, people know it. So, you know, give the uh, starting location uh, and then the ending location. So I've just shown here the actual Google map, uh, you know, things here and how exactly it calculates the shortest path by using the Digixtra's algorithm. It's a very famous algorithm. Digixtra, which you will study next semester. And uh, networks or graphs, again, be useful. This is what I said earlier for getting the foreground image, which we call it as the image segmentation. So assume that this is the input image where there is a background and I want to identify or focus only on the foreground image. You can see here it's done very efficiently which was my paper on what is known as deep convolution network pairs. So we have what is known as convolution neural network, CNN. I'll come to that neural network. That is also a graph kind of thing. And here I have added what is known as saliency prediction okay, for retrieval of natural images. And we can also do this for medical images. This is part of my research also I did. Uh, this uh, we have adopted our own algorithm here which is to identify only this portion, that means the foreground image. So these are some of the very interesting uh, applications where people can use uh, neural networks. That is also a graph based one. Uh, this is the shortest, sorry, a spanning tree based one. Uh, there is a real world uh, application which is specified here, uh, which quickly I'll go through. Assume that uh, uh, there is a city where we have so many areas. So each node represent that. Now these are the roads, you know, the edges are nothing but the roads. And, uh, and you have the, the government decides because now the rainstorm because the ground became very muddy and cars got struck, etc. The government decided to some of the streets to be paved. So payment has to be done in such a way that not from every node to other node, they have to reduce the cost uh, and the time also. And hence, they should be able to uh, provide means for moving from one city to the other, one location to the other, that's it. Maybe they can use via. So instead of having a direct one, maybe like this, okay? Either way, so whichever works out to be cheaper, they can just use this. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, problem which we can solve. This is useful even in a mobile network, TV network, etc. Uh, many people, uh, you know, use this kind of algorithms, uh, first modeling it as a network or a graph and then start using it. And uh, neural network, as I said, this is another kind of a graph, you know, uh, it is, uh, it, it consists of uh, what is known as processing element or called as neurons. So that everything is a very complex network. Our brain, for instance, uh, is a very complex network. 
a lot of research is going on in order to analyze the brain network itself, but it's very difficult. Okay, so we can just use this for pattern recognition, classification algorithm, learning process, all that. It's a simple ex example which shows to uh, identify or classify what is my input image is, uh, whether it is a dog or a cat or a lion or a bird. So as I said earlier, classification problem is very any unknown image here, we can find it out by building what is known as a correlation neural network. So it is a very complex network with what is known as many hidden layers. And uh, eventually we'll be able to find out whether it belongs to this category or not. So this is one of the applications of the correlation neural network. Another area where this is useful is called as flow network, where it is useful for the transportation problems. So maximum flow, uh, flow has to be you know, calculated. A lot of algorithms are there, which will be used, but basically it is the carrying capacity, you know, the edge cost actually, uh, the edge cost shows it is uh, the uh, capacity of this, you know, how much it can carry. It cannot go beyond that. So it's a flow, something like water network or a fluid dynamic kind of thing. Similarly, we can use this for matching problems, uh, finding the fewest member of, uh, you know, interpreters, for example, if you have interpreters on one end and languages on the other end, and we can just get the fewer number of interpreters in order to manage all the languages. Similarly, there's another example given here that assume that we have five people available apprentices and we have so many jobs, right? We have to manage all this and the best matching has to be done. Maybe industries, it's quite useful, uh, you know? So for example, Alan can actually do fitting, hand brake and uh, jack brake. So we just draw what is known as a bipartite graph. So, so this is a different kind of a graph. The graph itself, you have many varieties. Biconnected graph, bipartite graph, so many graphs are there. So using this, we can actually get the best mat matching. Coming to social networking, so that's a big network <laughs> under big data. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So what is it used for? It is mainly used for social network analysis. So what, what exactly we analyze in this? It is to analyze the patterns of interaction. See friend of friend, friends, that, this. In LinkedIn, how many people are linked to you, your account. All these kinds of influences can be measured. Discover central nodes and sub-networks, et cetera. And strength of relationship. See, there are a lot of metrics which they actually calculate. It's a very detailed discussion. So I'll not go into details. Uh, but basically, once you build a network, building a network itself, like uh, Facebook, which is very complicated, and uh, analyzing it is another big issue. So once you build a network or a graph, then we need to analyze it. So graph data structure is widely used in these social networks. Uh, okay, these are some of the applications where this will be useful, like self-awareness, community detection, marketing. Uh, you can just uh, find out, uh, you know, based upon the social network, how we can expand the marketing. Uh, then public health, maybe even COVID, uh, so we have different types of graphs under this social network, social graph, uh, intent graph, you know, this mainly for the, based on the intention of the users. So how, what they post and, uh, you know, uh, they just take all of them and analyze and then what is the intention. Consumption graph, it's useful for e-commerce. Amazon actually uses this. It's a payment graph actually. And, uh, interest graph and then mobile graph mainly for the GPS and IOT kind of because nowadays we have the internet of things uh, where uh, mobile devices will be useful in getting all these things workable on a smart basis. So they build what is known as a mobile graph. 
community clustering is another kind of a graph which you can see here, which is uh, uh, you know clustering the people in some localities, maybe in the red zone or orange zone or green zone, etc. And further being used for contact tracing as we are heading towards the second uh, type of uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, the another strain, people are now actually searching for uh, uh, the contacts of people who have traveled from UK to India. So according to the yesterday's news, yes, there are two, three people actually admitted in Nimans, Bangalore, out of six in India who have been tested positive of the Corona variant strain. So we have to have these graphs connected in such a way that we can trace very easily by applying the algorithms. Another area where this uh, graph is useful is to find out what is known as the uh, authoritative pages. Google page ranking algorithm is a very famous one. It is to find out, see the moment you give your keyword in the Google, you get a lot of snippets or the web links which are displayed. So the first few pages are the most authoritative. That means most uh, matching kind of uh, uh, links which you can believe, which you can uh, you know, get the most matching kind of links for your query word or the keyword. So how Google finds this out, how it gets the links. It's based upon what is known as a page ranking. For example, this page actually has got the highest rank. So based on the size, the ranking is higher. These are less. Why? Because all the rest of the pages, you can see that they reference this. This fellow reference, this, 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 this. So based upon this, so he gets more votes. Once he gets more votes, that means that he is given a higher ranking. So it, it uh, is calculated based upon what is known as an influence matrix and a web graph, first of course, web graph. So, so these are the you know, ways by which, I'll just show you in the next slide how it's constructed. This is an example for that. Assume that there are four pages, web pages, and uh, we can co construct uh, what is known as a web graph using this and uh, mark a directed edge from I to J when page I references page J, you know. If page I references page J, then put a directed edge. So you can see here, these are the references. That means page one references two, three, four. So you can see here, two, three, and four. So this, this, and this. So I'm putting I to J. Page one references two, three, four, and hence I'm putting this. Similarly, page two references three and four. So I need to add directed edges and so on. So I'll get this graph. Then from this graph, I can actually use iterative methods in order to find the ranking. Okay, I think that's was my last slide. And uh, I have started a YouTube channel um, around 15 days ago, I think, approximately. Uh, this is the URL. Uh, and you can search in the YouTube, Nanda Academies. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I'll not execute that. I mean, I'll not go to that uh, page, web page. But you can try this. But anyway, I'll be sharing my PPT. Uh, you can also go through this uh, PPT again and you can uh, send your queries if any to my email ID. But this is my YouTube channel. There are a few videos which are added now um, in the sense that in the area of algorithms, in the area of database, in the area of big data, in the area of data structures, everything, you know, all these are uh, my key areas of interest and research. And uh, I'll be adding more videos for which, of course, you can subscribe to my channel uh, after going through the videos. I think 